Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. If you're a regular viewer of the channel, you might remember that all the way back in July of 2020, we made a video about several instances where crimes were solved with the help of Google Earth and Google Maps. The video ended up being a hit, and ever since, we've gotten comments from a bunch of you saying that you'd love it if we could find some more similar cases and do a follow-up video. If you were one of the people that asked, well, then today's your lucky day, because we decided that this week we would circle back and do some digging, and we managed to find a few more examples that we hope you'll find informative and interesting. Oh, and if you haven't seen our first video, be sure to check that out next. We'll leave a link in the description below. Before we get to our list, if you enjoy our videos, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. It really helps us to continue building the channel, and if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. With that out of the way, here are four more crimes solved with the help of Google Maps. If you're a regular viewer of our Crimes of the Week International series, then chances are that you're already familiar with this first story, which we covered in our final episode of last year. It was also actually this case that reminded us to go back and search for more Google Earth and Maps-related crime stories to do this follow-up to our first video. In early January of 2022, Italian news outlets confirmed the arrest of one of the country's most wanted fugitives, a convicted murderer and mafia member named Gio Aquino Gamino. While Gamino had severed all ties with his friends and family back in Italy, and had managed to successfully avoid capture for nearly 20 years, what he hadn't counted on was being spotted on Google Street View. Gamino's life on the run started back in 2002, when he was incarcerated at the Rebibia prison in Rome. Though Gamino had been in trouble with the law many times before, and had previously served prison time for his activities with the Sicilian Mafia's Stida clan, this time, things were different. He was now serving a life sentence after being convicted of murder, drug trafficking, and Mafia collusion four years prior. However, Gamino would get a lucky break in June of that year, when a movie was being filmed at the prison where he was being held. During the shoot, an alarm sounded, notifying officials at the prison that someone was trying to climb over one of the facility walls and escape. The prisoner was quickly captured, but the resulting commotion allowed Gamino to slip away undetected in a crowd of inmate visitors, movie staff, and extras who were directed towards the prison's exits. It would later be theorized that the initial escape attempt was merely a staged distraction to allow Gamino to get away. Regardless, by the time Gamino's absence was noticed by prison guards at the facility, it was already too late. He was hours ahead of them and managed to vanish without a trace. For the next 19 years, Sicilian police worked every angle they could think of to try and track Gamino down. While this was extremely difficult, since the mobster had effectively cut ties with everyone from his former life, traditional investigative work did manage to narrow down the search to Spain. It was here where the final piece of the puzzle would be uncovered. While it's unclear who made the actual discovery, in late 2021, someone noticed a man matching Gamino's description who had been captured on Google Street View in the Spanish town of Galapagal, not too far from Madrid. The man was standing outside of a grocery store called El Huerto de Menú, or Menú's Garden. The now 61-year-old fugitive's identity was confirmed when authorities continued digging and discovered a Facebook page for a now-closed but similarly named restaurant in the area called Cocina de Menu, or Menu's Kitchen. Not only did the restaurant have Sicilian dishes on the menu, but there was an image of a man wearing chef's clothes amongst the restaurant's photos. It was Gamino, recognizable by a unique scar on the left side of his chin. It turned out that Gamino had been busy in his nearly two decades on the run. He had changed his name to Manuel, married, and had opened several businesses with his new wife. 
when Gamino was arrested by Spanish authorities on December 17th, he was reportedly in disbelief, asking police, quote, How did you find me? I haven't even called my family for 10 years. At the time of this video, Gamino is currently in custody in Spain, though Sicilian police are hoping to have him extradited to Italy by the end of February. Shortly before 3 a.m. on June 16th, 2017, a woman in her 30s walked into a truck stop near Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin, and pleaded with the driver there to let her use his cell phone. When the driver handed over the phone, the woman, who was dressed in medical scrubs and had clear injuries to her face, immediately called 911. She said that she had just been attacked by two men. When police arrived at the scene, the woman, identified only by the initials MD for privacy reasons, told them a truly chilling story. Earlier that evening, she had been driving home from her shift at a hospital in Milwaukee when the unthinkable had happened. An unknown man had smashed her window while she was stopped at a highway exit and had used the opening to jump inside. The man was armed with a box cutter and a hammer and told her to drive to a second location. A pickup truck driven by the man's accomplice followed behind them as they went. After a while, the man told MD to pull over, then forced her into the pickup truck. As the second man drove them around, the first assaulted and violated her. Though the men threatened to shoot MD, eventually they left her at the side of the road after stealing her phone and purse. While MD's ordeal was nightmarish enough on its own, it was made all the more terrifying when investigators realized it was similar to another incident that had occurred in nearby Kenosha just hours earlier. Shortly before midnight on June 15th, two women had called 911, telling dispatchers that someone with a baseball bat was following them. About 15 minutes earlier, they had left a Buffalo Wild Wings with some friends, and as they exited the parking lot, they noticed a vehicle was following them. It was a dark-colored pickup truck. The pickup truck had tailed the women so closely it had almost hit their vehicle, and at two different points when the women were forced to stop, an unknown man had gotten out of the truck and had tried to approach them, carrying a weapon. Thankfully, the women had been able to get away. Though police were confident that this incident was connected to the attack on MD, they knew the odds of solving the seemingly random crimes was not in their favor. Still. They began to collect whatever evidence they could, especially from MD, who was able to give a basic description of the suspects as well as the truck that they were driving. Her abandoned car was processed for fingerprints, and swabs were taken as part of a sexual assault kit in the hopes that it would yield some of the perpetrator's DNA. However, it was while retracing the route of MD's kidnapping that investigators would ultimately get the clue that would break the case wide open. It happened when she mentioned that while she was being driven around by her attackers, she had seen one of them pull up Google Maps on his Samsung Galaxy phone as they had passed General Mitchell Airport. According to MD, the app had still been running when the men abandoned her at the side of the highway. This gave one of the investigators, Milwaukee Police Detective Eric Drager, an idea. While he initially considered trying to do a more conventional cell tower dump, Drager decided he might get more accurate information if he instead went to Google and asked if location data they collected directly from Google Maps could be provided to assist with the investigation. Though he didn't know it at the time, this line of inquiry would soon lead him to obtain something called a geofence warrant. Essentially, a geofence warrant is a type of search warrant that allows investigators to search a database to find all mobile devices that were active within a particular geographic area at a given time. Because MD told police that her attackers had been using Google Maps at the time of her kidnapping and was able to tell them where she was, they now had something to go on. As a side note, for anyone wondering why the police didn't simply try and track MD's stolen cell phone, Apparently, they actually did. However, the phone was turned off by the attackers when it was stolen, and apparently couldn't be traced. Anyway, with the help of a couple of representatives from Google, 
Drager was able to obtain his geofence warrant and update it to include several key locations beyond just the airport. These locations included the place where MD had been abducted, the place where she had been released, and a bar where her stolen credit card was used the night after the attack. It turned out that Google's data showed just one phone had been at all of these locations, a Samsung Galaxy that belonged to a 28-year-old El Salvadoran national named Jose Arevalo Vieira. A little digging into Vieira's background seemed to suggest that he was capable of committing such a crime. He had formally served prison time in Kentucky in 2008 for unlawful imprisonment. With that, investigators contacted Vieira's cell phone provider and obtained emergency tracking on his cell phone, allowing them to follow him. He was arrested on June 20th just outside of Louisville, Kentucky, after briefly trying to flee from police and was charged with numerous offenses related to the kidnapping and assault on MD four days prior. A day after Vieira was taken into custody, police were able to track down his accomplice, Grabiel Arias Martinez, who was also in Kentucky. He was arrested and charged as well, and he and Vieira were both brought to Wisconsin to face charges. With the suspects behind the brutal crime now identified, Drager and the other detectives working the case were able to definitively connect them thanks to the evidence that they had previously collected. Not only was MD able to identify Vieira in a photo lineup as her attacker, a fingerprint lifted from her car, as well as the DNA evidence taken from the assault kit, were also matched to him. In February of 2019, Martinez pled guilty to kidnapping and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Vieira opted to go to trial, and later that year, he was convicted of seven different charges for his role in the crime, and was sentenced to more than 100 years in prison. This past year, in July of 2021, Vieira was also linked to the stalking incident in Kenosha that took place hours before the attack on MD, and was given a further 18 months, with six additional months of extended supervision. As one final note about this story, it's worth mentioning that in the years since this case was solved, the use of geofence warrants in police investigations has become increasingly controversial. Many privacy advocates argue that the technique is a violation of the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution regarding unreasonable search and seizure, and some have taken steps to try and get geofence warrants banned in certain states. As far as we can tell, though, it seems that every year since 2016, Companies like Google, Apple, Uber, and Lyft have continued to receive more geofence warrants from law enforcement agencies across the United States. In early January of 2009, police in Athol, Massachusetts received an alarming phone call from the legal guardians of nine-year-old Natalie Malte. What had started out as a weekend visit with her grandmother had now turned into an alleged kidnapping. According to Natalie's guardians, on Saturday, January 3rd, the nine-year-old's 52-year-old grandmother, Rose, had come to pick her up from their home, with the expectation that she would return the following day. However, Sunday came and went, with no sign of Natalie. When they contacted Rose, she reportedly told them that they would never see the nine-year-old again. Thanks to information provided by Natalie's guardians, Athol police had some idea where to focus their search. They knew that she had relatives in Rhode Island, and that her biological mother, Marlena Santos, lived in Louisiana. Still, with more than a day's head start, investigators were also aware that Rose could really have taken Natalie anywhere. Knowing that the girl had a cell phone, on January 5th, police first tried the most obvious thing, and called her. Surprisingly, Natalie picked up, and investigators were able to talk to both her and her grandmother. Rose told police that they were in Rhode Island, but refused to give up their exact location. She said that Natalie wasn't in any danger, and that she would turn herself in the following morning. When Rose failed to follow through with her promise, police knew that they would need to find another way to track her and Natalie down. Keenly aware that they were likely not in Rhode Island, and that Rose had instead used the fake surrender to buy herself even more time. 
As a result, police reached out to Natalie's cell phone carrier, requesting that they give them GPS coordinates for the phone. The phone company was able to provide police with a stream of ongoing data, showing the approximate location of the cell phone to within a few hundred feet each time it was activated. Because investigators believed that Natalie and her grandmother would be heading through Knoxville, Tennessee, their initial plan was to track them once they left, using the direction they went to give them a better idea of their final destination. However, the quick thinking of one person, Athol Deputy Fire Chief Thomas Lozier, would make that unnecessary. The Deputy Fire Chief had reportedly been asked to assist with the kidnapping case because of his extensive experience with GPS technology. When he took a look at the coordinates that the cell phone company was providing, he noticed that several of them were coming from an intersection in the town of Natural Bridge, Virginia, roughly 600 miles away from where Natalie had originally gone missing. Knowing that, Lozier jumped onto Google Maps and, using the service's Street View feature, started to look at the area around the intersection. When he did, he noticed a long building with a red roof across a nearby field that looked like a motel. A second Google search revealed that the building in question was a budget inn, and after Lozier took a look at the place on Street View, he reportedly told police that's where they should focus their attention. Sure enough, when Virginia police were contacted and asked to check out the motel, they found Natalie unharmed and were able to take Rose into custody. While it's unclear if Rose was ever convicted of a crime, Reports at the time of the incident say that she was awaiting extradition back to Massachusetts to face charges. The same articles state that Natalie was put temporarily in the custody of the Virginia Department of Social Services until she could be returned to her legal guardians. Before the summer of 2008, if you looked up the town of Cary, North Carolina, Chances are, you'd see nothing but positive things. Its neighborhoods were lined with nice cars and beautiful homes, filled mostly with married couples and their children. It was the kind of place where neighbors regularly got together for barbecues, and was safe enough that children could play freely outside. In short, a veritable picture of the American dream. However, in July of that year, Kerry would become known for something far more sinister, a brutal and controversial murder case. Carrie's success had been fueled by an influx of well-paying tech jobs into North Carolina, which beginning in the 1990s had attracted thousands of young, educated people looking to put down roots, among them a couple named Brad and Nancy Cooper. Born just a few weeks apart from each other in Alberta, Canada in 1973, Brad and Nancy met each other while working at IBM in the city of Calgary in 1999. When the two began dating, it was initially something of a surprise to Nancy's family. She was extroverted and fun-loving, and had typically gone for outgoing men, whereas Brad was quiet and reserved. However, at this point in her life, Nancy was looking for something stable. She wanted kids and a steady life, telling one of her sisters that she loved Brad and that he felt safe. Though Brad and Nancy initially wanted a big wedding, their plans abruptly changed when Brad got a job at Cisco in North Carolina, and the two were instead married at a small family ceremony in October of 2000. Shortly after that, they moved to Cary, where they settled down and a few years later started a family, welcoming their first daughter into the world in 2004 and their second in 2006. From the outside, it seemed like everything was perfect. That was, until July 12th, 2008. That afternoon, one of Nancy's friends, Jessica Adam, called 911, clearly in a panic. She said that Nancy was supposed to be at her house that morning at 8 a.m., but that she hadn't shown up. It was completely unlike her. Though she didn't quite say it directly, Jessica conveyed that she was suspicious of Nancy's husband. When police spoke to Brad, he reportedly offered little help regarding his wife's sudden disappearance. He said that she had gone out jogging that morning and had failed to return home. However, he was vague about the details and didn't really give an explanation as to why he hadn't reported her missing himself. After speaking to other witnesses, investigators learned that Nancy had last been seen the previous night, 
when she, Brad, and their two daughters had attended a Friday night barbecue with neighbors. Though nothing had seemed out of the ordinary between the couple that night, Brad had reportedly returned home early with the girls, leaving Nancy behind to ostensibly mingle a bit longer with friends before heading home herself. For the next two days, police and hundreds of volunteers searched the surrounding neighborhood near the Cooper's home on Wallsburg Court, but came up empty-handed. That was, until a man out walking his dog made a startling discovery. The man had been walking through an undeveloped subdivision just outside of Cary when he noticed something strange in the storm water near a drainage ditch. Vultures were hanging around. When he went to investigate, he found the lifeless body of a woman. It was Nancy Cooper. She had been strangled to death and left about three miles away from her home. With the revelation that Nancy had been murdered, police once again turned their attention to her husband Brad. In their eyes, his behavior had only grown stranger since they first spoke with him. He was noticeably absent at memorials for his wife as well as press conferences and chose instead to speak only through his lawyers. A few days after the discovery of Nancy's body, Brad's lawyers held a press conference of their own, explaining that they were there to confront the, quote, wild speculation about the case. They said that the reason that Brad had not been seen mourning his wife's loss was that he was a very private person. The wild speculation the lawyers were referring to, of course, were the feelings of many who were now starting to believe that Brad could be responsible for Nancy's murder especially as more and more news began to come out, shedding a different light on their supposedly happy marriage. According to Nancy's family, the relationship had been far from perfect. Their problems had started almost as soon as they moved to Kerry. Without a work visa, Nancy was unable to legally get a job in the United States and quickly became bored, frustrated, and unhappy with her loss of independence. As early as 2002, when she had returned home to Edmonton for Christmas, Nancy told her family that she didn't want to go back to her life in North Carolina. However, Brad had reportedly flown out and convinced her to go back. Things improved for a while when Nancy started to make friends in her new hometown and got a car. She was even able to earn a little bit of money working as a nanny. It was during this period of relative calm that the couple had their two daughters. However, by the time of Nancy's murder, the relationship was on the brink of collapse. Nancy knew that Brad was cheating on her with more than one woman and was listening into her phone calls when she would talk to her family about their marriage. She told her parents that she wanted to leave and go back to Canada, but that she felt stuck. In particular, she worried about her daughters. A lawyer told her that if things didn't go her way during the divorce, she could lose everything, including custody of her children, who were American citizens. Nancy's family said that the last time they had seen her was on a vacation to South Carolina earlier in July of 2008. On that trip, she had apparently seemed like a shell of her former self, and they had decided they needed to intervene. When they got home, Nancy's parents retained a lawyer to help their daughter figure out her situation with her children. Six days later, she was dead. When police talked to some of the friends that Nancy was close with in North Carolina, and did some more digging. They reportedly discovered that the situation with the Cooper's marriage was worse than even Nancy's family had known. When investigators looked into Nancy's work visa, they learned that Brad had never actually applied for one for her. They suspected that this was an intentional means of financial control, making her unable to work and thus fully dependent on him. Their reason for believing this was based on statements from Nancy's friends who said that in the year leading up to her death, Nancy was quietly selling her clothes and painting people's houses just to buy groceries for her and her children. They also claimed that Brad filled up her car with a limited amount of gas to make sure that she could never travel farther away than he wanted her to. Chillingly, the friends also claimed that Nancy had been sleeping with her daughters in a locked bedroom, keeping her car keys in her pocket at all times. When investigators performed a search of Brad's laptop, they allegedly found out that he had hacked his wife's email account and was reading all of the communications between her and her family. In short, he knew that Nancy wanted out and was taking steps to leave him and take the girls. 
The final and most damning piece of evidence investigators found against Brad was also on his computer and came in the form of several Google Maps searches he had reportedly made in the days before Nancy's murder. These included several zoomed-in satellite image searches of the area directly over where Nancy's body would later be found. Brad Cooper was charged with the first-degree murder of his wife at the end of October of 2008. At his trial in March of 2011, prosecutors argued that Brad had come home early from the barbecue on the night of the murder and had put his kids to bed before waiting for Nancy to return home. When she did, he had attacked and killed her before dumping her body and cleaning up the crime scene. Though it was not the only evidence against him, the Google Maps data found on Brad's laptop was integral to the prosecution's case, and when the trial ended two months later, Brad was convicted of murder and sentenced to life in prison. While this initially seemed like the end of the case, Brad's lawyers would successfully appeal his case two years later, on the grounds that the first trial judge had made a mistake by not allowing a defense expert to challenge the Google Maps data found on Brad's computer. The defense had wanted to argue that the data on Brad's computer had been tampered with and that he was being framed for the crime. However, the trial court had found that the defense witness in question was not qualified as a forensic computer analyst. Regardless, the appeals court stated that the expert's testimony should not have been limited and a new trial was ordered. In a surprise decision, though, rather than waiting for a new trial, Brad signed a plea agreement with prosecutors pleading guilty to second-degree murder in 2014. As part of his guilty plea, he reportedly cleared the way for his daughters to be adopted by Nancy's sister, as they were already living back in Canada by this point. Brad was sentenced to 12 to 15 years in prison. Despite this guilty plea, privately, Brad reportedly continues to maintain his innocence, saying that he was set up. Understandably, this has made the case somewhat controversial, and there are those that steadfastly believe him. Perhaps the best example of this is a blog maintained by one of Brad's supporters called Justice for Brad Cooper, which claims that Brad's decision to plead guilty to second-degree murder was a calculated one to avoid prison time and because his trial lawyers weren't ready. Of course, like many controversial cases, it's difficult to know what to make of any of these claims. And as far as the official record is concerned, as well as Nancy's family, investigators put away the right person. The most up-to-date information we could find on the case was from November of 2020, when Brad Cooper completed his prison sentence. Articles from the time say that he was awaiting extradition to Canada, where he would be released as a free man. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.